next speaker, Brother Wayne Blake, is a graduate of Free Harlem University back in 1992 and of Spring Bible Institute here in 1998. He preached full time for 12 years and part time for about 20 years. He's preached in Texas, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Tennessee, worked with youth camps in Texas, Louisiana, spoken on lectureships in Texas, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Florida. His wife, Laura, and Wayne have a daughter, Jenna, seven. Wayne, I told her a while ago she had a very pretty dress on, and it was for a pretty girl, and she says, I know. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, they are members of Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas, and I think we can say, and there are certain other members of Fish Hatchery Road Congregation here, that Spring and Fish Hatchery have a close relationship, a good working relationship, and that's because we're of the same mind and the same judgment on those matters that pertain to salvation and God living, and we pray that we'll continue to be that way, and just think, it wasn't that many years ago where you could say that about most congregations of the Lord's people. But it's not that way anymore. Brother Wayne, we want you to come speak to us, and I hope all will give good attention as he speaks to us on Is Christ Divided, a book by Monroe Hawley, the late Monroe Hawley. I want to begin, first of all, by saying uh, I am very encouraged and thankful for all the prayers and things that were offered on my behalf, the encouraging words, cards that were sent, and emails uh, during my surgery that I had in December. Um, I'm wearing it, so, you know, that's about the best I can do right now. But hopefully things will continue as they are, and I am thankful for all the words of encouragement. I read this book about two or three times. And one morning, one night I woke up about two, three o'clock more, my arm was burning. And I got to thinking about it, and I remembered it's because I licked my armpit so many times to get that taste out of my mouth every time I read it, <laughs> that I was chafing under my arm. I, uh, you know, uh, it's interesting to read some of these books. Um, I wish they were free on the internet. It would be a little bit better. But to me, to understand this book and understand what motivates him for writing this book I'm going to have to tell you this little story that he presents that is basically a springboard for all that he says through this whole book. He says, it was June 1968, and John Ed Clark, a newly arrived American missionary to Ethiopia, was preaching at, now I'm, gonna, I'm sure I'm just going to blister these words, so just be prepared for that, at Gunjo in the, in the district of Kambata. About 100 people had gathered to hear him speak, uh, in this, and, and in the audience was a, was a stranger unknown to anyone in the area. For two hours he listened as the preacher taught the word of God, and for another hour as he answered questions. Finally the visitor stood up, and he explained that he had come from the other side of the Omo River in Kaffa province, two days away by mule ride. He said that he and his people had heard that representatives of a church in America had come to Ethiopia. They understood that these people taught the Bible just as they did. He had come to see if it was true. Now, if we left it there, this is a very neat tale, and uh, it's very interesting because here you go in some foreign country, and here's a group coming saying, hey, we preach and teach the Bible just like you. But it doesn't stop there. He said, conversation with the visitor revealed that he was a primary leader of a group of disciples who were simply following the teachings of the Bible. They numbered 1,500 members in, 31, in 51 congregations. And for over 40 years, they had not affiliated with any denomination. They called themselves the church and spoke of individual members simply as Christians. They immersed for the remission of sins. However, they did not observe the Lord's Supper weekly. Later visits to these people verified the representations made by their leader. And then he begins asking some questions. He says, were they Christians? 
Did their failure to observe the Lord's Supper every day make the brothers in error from whom Christian fellowship should be withheld? One responses to these questions is predicated on two assumptions. First of all, that the information as related here is subsequently correct. He's already said it is, so it is correct. And secondly, that the Because of biblical precedent, is it important for Christians to partake of the Lord's Supper weekly? The second is called an assumption because to many Protestants who do not accept the validity of the restoration principle, the frequency of taking the Lord's Supper is not particularly important. And that's where, like I say, this goes a little bit further into the book, but you have to understand that story to understand what he's driving at as he goes through this book. Because then he begins to use this as a way to ridicule anyone who would call into question these folks over here uh, that do everything like we do except they just don't participate in the Lord's Supper weekly. You know, it never ceases to amaze me that people will flock to a Christian bookstore and purchase all kind of books. And it just, it just ceases to amaze me. Uh, the, the stuff that people will buy that will do nothing to increase their faith nor encourage them to be better Christians. It's not going to do that. Uh, if anything, it will cause more confusion as we have enough of that already in the, in the world uh, as we live now. But there are some things that he will go into. He will look at what you call sex, S-E-C-T, uh, the idea of groups that uh, divide over this and that. And uh, in his mind, uh, anybody that would say that those uh, poor Ethiopian Africans are wrong and call them on the carpet for it, he would call you a sect. In other words, you're trying to ban something on somebody, and therefore you're one of these dividers. He also talks about Pharisees and fellowship, the church, judging as well as the name Christian. And the thing that I, I am constantly reminded of is something I say often anytime I preach is, is simply this. God knowing who we are because he is our creator has never left us on our own to try to figure out what's acceptable to him. He's never done that. You go all the way back to Genesis, all the way to the book of Revelation, and you can read Uh, particularly in the three dispensations as we read about them, the patriarchy, the mosaical, and the Christian age, in all three of those dispensations, God very clearly told those people what he expected them to do in order to worship him. And those who abused it, like Nadab and Abihu, like Ananias and Sapphira, what do we learn about that? That God prescribes certain things for us to do, and if it's abused, God's punishment will be meted out on those who abuse it. Because God is very plain. So let's look at some of the main points. First of all, a sect. A sect, uh, he defines, is those uh, within the church of those who misuse the scriptures to fragment the body of Christ. And um, he never really defines what misuse means. He uses some of the, he alludes to examples of those who may be of the anti-persuasion, that, you know, binding man-made traditions and saying they must be. Uh, He may use that, but, you know, what about we who strive to do only what God wants us to do? Well, we would be a sect too because we wouldn't fall in his group of people. Uh, So we would also be a sect. He believes that many misuse the scriptures, and by doing that, it causes much division. Therefore, you begin another sect. And upon this kind of thinking, it's basically subjective feelings. In other words, you know, what I feel is right, we're going to go with that, and we'll uh, fellowship anybody that will go along with me on that. But, you know, if you decide to put your foot down and not put up with this, well, then you're the one causing the division. Therefore, you're in a sect upon yourself. You're not one of us. Well, why is this important? Well, he says, sectarianism was acceptable, was accepted as normal. 
Though one might be a Pharisee or a Sadducee, he will recognize those of, another, of the other party as fellow Jews. And he did not claim that those uh, in the, his party were true Jews. But what he does say is this. The sectarian spirit often dwells on details and technicalities, but may overlook the substance of the word of God. Christians who dispute over the specifics of how the Lord's Supper should be eaten may miss the spirit that the sacred meal is intended to promote. In other words, uh, who cares about when you take it? It's all about why you're taking it. It's not about the frequency. He opens the door to the idea that there are faithful Christians in all sects that are out there. They're faithful. But we're just a little off on some things. But, you know, we're still trying to work all under this big umbrella, working together as Christians. Well, he goes on to say the idea is that uh, he, he leaves the door open for possibility that there are uh, Christians in all denominations. And those who don't agree are of a sectarian viewpoint. So if we will not fellowship someone outside the body of Christ in his view, and we call and he calls them a Christian and we won't fellowship them, then we're being divisive. And like I say, a lot of this stuff is not anything new. Uh, it's not uh, anything we haven't heard before. But it's interesting to me how that he uses this one story to try to uh, put forth uh, his viewpoint. You know, he recognized that some would say that they need to repent before they can be accepted in fellowship. And he's talking again about these, after these Ethiopians. He says, you know, I understand some would say that. But he states that making people repent when they feel that they have done nothing wrong is hypocritical. I agree with that. How can you ask someone to repent if they don't understand what they're repenting of? And the idea he's getting at here is just simply, you know, those poor Ethiopians, just leave them alone. Let God sort that out. It's not for us to judge. And I find it very interesting that he, uh, he puts himself out there as, a, as one who was uh, very concerned about preaching the gospel to uh, lost people and nations all over this country. And yet not one time in this book does he ever mention that they ever tried to sit down with this man and convince him that he needed to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. He lost this opportunity. He doesn't, in fact, all he does is try to berate people who would think otherwise. Why would you go down there and bother him? Leave him alone. He's our brother. Let God sort that out. We, we, we meet on everything else but this, so leave him alone. He talks about judging and judgmentalism. He says it is judgmental to tell another person that he's going straight to hell if he does not comply with a specific divine command. He says the judgment may be correct, but no one has a right to do God's work for him. Now, I understand in principle what he's getting at there. But if it is the case that I cannot make a judgment based upon sound, rational understanding of the scriptures and try to show where someone is in error, if I can't do that, then why am I concerned to who's a Christian or not who's a Christian? Leave that up to God. That's not up to me. And the idea here is, is that he's trying to say that a judgmental spirit stems from a legalistic approach to the Christian faith which allows God no leeway in his dealings with man. So on the day of judgment, God's going to give some people a second chance. Well, you know, you were just ignorant. You didn't know any better. Uh, we're just going to let that go. And to me, it, it, puts, it calls into question everything about God. Can I really, truly believe what he has told me about the day of judgment? Can I truly believe everything he's told me about heaven? about what really baptism will do for me. Because if God's word is not true, then why would I believe anything he said? 
even on this subject. He thinks it is incorrect to think that man can correctly interpret the scriptures. He says we might be wrong, therefore. Therefore, we need to leave the judging up to God. He does not think one needs to teach the truth, but to pr pronounce a personal judgment on the one being taught. He has exceeded his role as a teacher. And to have this opinion of himself, of oneself, and the idea here is about the relation of making judgments based upon interpretation of scripture, is a sign of a spiritual problem. If you go around and you try to show someone the truth and you tell them if you stay in this, you will die in your sins, in his mindset, it's not that person who's got the problem. You're the one that's got the problem. And it goes back into this idea of you are being sectarian in your viewpoint in dealing with other people. What about Paul? You know, Paul made judgments regarding the Corinthian brethren without even being there in person. And yet he told those brethren there how to handle the young man who had married his father's wife. Well, in Mr. Hawley's viewpoint, Paul was in sin. Paul, you're going too far there, Paul. You can't judge these people. Jesus told us to judge righteous judgment. John 7 and verse 24. And the nature of righteous judgment is not hypocritical but it's one of a pure heart and for the love of the soul in whom we are correcting. A teacher will teach the truth and correct those who are not adhering to what is being taught. You know, in the secular world, we receive teaching and, and, and training in schools uh, as well as even in our own secular work. And during that training, we might make mistakes and need to, be, need to take correction and make adjustments. No one sees a problem with that. But boy, when we get into the spiritual world, don't, don't mess with me on that. Leave a little leeway there. God will sort that out. He says about our speech, it will determine who we are. He says, that, first of all, that sectarian speech. He says, when Peter denied that he was one of Jesus' disciples, the bystanders knew he was with him when, he, when his speech gave him away. Matthew 26 and verse 73. And one who professes to be undenominational will fall on de deaf ears if he speaks sectarian language. And he gives us some of that speech. He says an example of sectarian speech is the common misuse of the term Church of Christ. The words simply identify the body for which Jesus died as Christ's church. And it is a descriptive expression as are other, other biblical terms such as Church of God, the body of Christ, the kingdom, and the way. None of these is a proper name. In fact, there is no proper name in the New Testament that collectively identifies biblical congregations. To employ any biblical term to the virtual exclusion of others is to use a scriptural expression in a sectarian way. To speak of Churches of Christ doctrine, or the Church of Christ preacher, or a Church of Christ member, or a Church of Christ school, and even the Church of Christ churches, reveals a sectarian mindset that is surely as if one spoke of Baptist doctrine or Baptist preachers or Baptist ministers, Baptist schools, Baptist churches. The message conveyed by such speech is that we are a set of denominations like the Baptists, the Methodists, or the Lutherans. Instead of Church of Christ doctrine, why not just say the Bible? Instead of Church of Christ members, why not just say Christian? Instead of Church of Christ preachers, why not use biblical language to identify gospel preachers? It is not improper to use any scriptural term such as Church of Christ if we do so biblically. We do not do this when we use it extensively to describe the Lord's spiritual body. I have corrected people a lot of times when they say, oh, you're one of them Church of Christ, you're one of them Church of Christers. And I don't like that term when they say that to you. Because it does. It distinguishes you like you're another denomination. And I try to refer to them just simply, no, I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the, the, the church that the New Testament speaks about. Try to, try to correct them nicely. But try to get away from that type of idea. And there's no doubt in my mind that sometimes we ought to be very careful about the kind of words we use. 
Uh, <clears throat> but the term Church of Christ is nothing more than a term used to distinguish the church from all others who claim to be the church. And there should be no problem using biblical terms for biblical things. Paul said, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you, Romans 16 and verse 16. And if the Apostle Paul used the term, can those who are members of the church say the same? There is no doubt that we use biblical language to describe biblical things. The term church of Christ, the word reverend, the idea of a pastor or a Christian are words given to us that we read about in the Bible. But you know, reverend refers only to God. Well, then we can't call another man a name used for God. So yes, we do need to be careful of the type of words that we use. I've been called reverend, I can't believe it, how many times. In fact, even when they have done something about us and put it in the paper and I corrected the person who was going to write it, they still put reverend. That just drove me crazy. And I'm thinking, you, you write papers. You're supposed to make sure you have the information correct. Or pastor. Um, pastor, as we know, refers to an elder. <clears throat> a Christian refers to any who are members of the Lord's church. And the problem comes when you use these words in a way to describe people who are violating the use in the scriptures. Another area that he talks about is the idea of unity. He says, can there be unity among the sectarian spirit in the church today? And then he begins to try to answer that question. Uh, we're not going to read all of this, but the idea is that basically what he says is, as long as we hold on to our sectarian attitudes, there, can no be, there cannot be true unity. But he's willing to leave the door open for a little uni unity and diversity. You know, just understand that, you know, we... We've all got to work together. We're all trying to do the same thing, even though you may be, believe this, you may believe that, but we can all work together. <clears throat> the key of knowledge. I never fully understood what he was getting at on this. And I read that chapter uh, at least 10, 12 times. And I'm going to, I'm putting down the best I can do to try to understand what he's talking about here. He says that we are to be united on matters of faith and be willing to consolidate in matters of opinion. Well, in that, I agree. He says but his next discussion is the subject he titles the key of knowledge. He says, we seek to determine loyalty to Christ on the basis of brotherhood issues. We're taking away the key of knowledge from the average Christian. If one refuses to line up with a certain position, he may by default be classified as belonging to the other side, even if he has no firm view on the matter. Usually the issues are pushed by religious publications, some of which were begun with the express purpose of promoting certain contemporary positions. I think he would be talking about this one too, because in his mind that's the express purpose of it, to point out faults. Well, he believes you're being a disservice to the brotherhood. Too long we have placed the yardstick on the superficial. Christians need to desist from evaluating congregations by the attitudes on specific issues. Perhaps the questions in debate are important, but to correctly evaluate, we must examine the whole congregation. Its worship, its doctrine, its attitudes, its dedications, its zeal to save souls. When we do that, we will find that every congregation falls short of perfection. What is the process by which the key of knowledge is taken away from God's people? Essentially, it involves marking and ostracizing those who do not toe the party line. Now, I will be the first one to say the church is not a party. We're not divided up like Democrats, Republicans, or any other kind of thing. We are doing our best, as all of us ought to, to do things the way God wants them done. And those who will do what God wants them done, we will be united. Those who won't, we won't be united with them. It's just that simple. I know that a charge has been made against we who are trying to toe the line on this fellowship and other things that we are dealing with currently. And they have said, well, you know, that's just part of being a, a buddyhood or whatever else you want to name it. That's not what this is about. This is about doing what God wants done in regards to fellowship. 
And uh, we're not going to give that stand up. Because if we give that up, what else are we going to give up? Just like many have already done. You know, he says that, you know, there are a lot of techniques used by those who are greatly concerned for doctrinal truth. And he called, he, the group he calls uh, the ex excesses in the fundamentalist movement. And if you really want to know who they are, he's basically call it, talking to us. He says, this group is identified by Edward Dodson, senior editor of the Fundamentalist Journal, journal who lays out the abuses. First of all, he says, well, they, they name call. They call names. <clears throat> you know, I find it interesting <laughs> But this goes back to the liberal mindset. They don't see it in themselves, but yet they see it in those that they want to call for it. If you read this book, that's all he does in here is call names. If you don't line up with his viewpoint on this particular idea, he's willing to allow for you to be a brother or a sister in Christ and be a part of this big tent. But he's got some problems with you. First of all, you're sectarian. First of all, you're this. Secondly, you're this. Thirdly, you're this. He's doing the very thing with which he says others do. He says they call them derogatory names such as neo, pseudo, weak need, and liberal. It is much easier to condemn them than to cooperate. That's not true, but sometimes it could be. But there's no doubt in my mind that many people have been asked to repent, gone to in person and talked to, and they refuse to. Well, if that's the case, then we've got to cut our losses and go on. We cannot fellowship those who will not be in fellowship with God. He also talks about those who have religious paranoia. He says those that are perceiving as being in positions of authority who see their influence threatened by others who are out to get them. Their vocabulary is filled with the language of warfare. The word fight, contend, battle, and defend then he would have a problem with the Apostle Paul. He'd have a problem with Jesus because those were words that they used and the words that we must understand and defend even today. He questions, he mentions isolation as a part of the marking process. He says that this technique stems from a sincere desire to achieve doctrinal and ecclesiastical purity but results in constant arguing and, spit and splitting. For example, speakers on lectureship may be limited to those who share the same perspective on a group of controversial issues. Naturally, those attending are of the same persuasion. Exposure to other views which might give biblical insight on difficult past, uh, questions is not permissible. Well, it's not permissible because they're teaching error. It's just that simple. We cannot have error taught and not refute it. We've got to stand against it. He also makes one other thing, and I skipped over it somehow, and I had it marked too. Um, well, we'll go on. That's the, yeah, because we're running out of time. I only got an hour left. Let's move on. Let's discuss some of the things he's saying. First of all, the Ethiopians and the Lord's Supper. Now, the Lord's Supper is a time when the partaker is to remember the Lord's death as well as the great sacrifice that was done on his behalf. And that's been mentioned already this morning and probably even yesterday. But God's word has not left us without instructions concerning the time and frequency with this memorial feast is, is to be taken. In Acts 20 and verse 7, I pulled a Brother Denham here. Boy, I did some Greek. I'm going to tell you, uh, Brother Bob Rar was our Greek teacher, and I rued the day every day I walked in that room. I, whew, that was some tough stuff there, boy. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, we find the fact that part of the express purpose of the New Testament Christians coming together was to partake of the Lord's Supper. In Acts 16, verse 1 and 2, we read the phrase, upon the first day of the week. I know that because of translation and things like that, sometimes we don't get the full meaning of what that, word, what that phrase is trying to say, but that phrase means literally upon the first day of every week. 
There's no disputing that. The Bible teaches this. And therefore, the, the word kata indicates that the saints gathered on the first day of every week. This comes from a Vincent, page 288. And if the saints gathered every first day of the week, and part of their express purpose as such meetings was to take the Lord's Supper, it is evident that they were instructed to take the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. Now, Brother Hawley would say, well, yeah, I know what you're saying, but, you know, you can't go down there judging those people. You can't tell them they got to change. You know, I, like I say, I wish he would have gone a little bit further into what his uh, actions were in regarding to these brethren down there, because if they truly are brethren, they're erring brethren, because they're not taking the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. I take it only by what he's saying here that they taught and believed as we do. I don't know. But the point that Hawley was trying to make by this example of the Ethiopians was not a matter, uh, was that no matter when they partook the Lord's Supper, they remain our brethren. The feeling he has is that we must not correct them or stir them up, but allow them to decide for themselves. You know, if, that's the, if that is truly a biblical principle, then brethren, we need to quit going out preaching to people about the gospel. Just leave them alone. Because on day of judgment, God's going to remember, God's going to look at that and say, you know, nobody came to your house. Nobody sat down with you and tried to teach this. Therefore, I'm going to allow you. Because, you know, you just, there was nothing else you could do. These brethren had the opportunity to teach these brethren the truth. And it was up to them to decide if they were going to do it. Unity. The drive toward denominationalism is evident for the clamor of unity. The problem with this drive is that it begin, brings about almost disunity, division, and diversity. The dividing and sectarian attitude is alive and well in this push. This, they, this idea is basically to each his own. You just do whatever you want to do. And therefore... Uh, and if you don't, it's going to cause division. And we don't want to be a divisionist because then we, we, land, we land over here in this sectarian attitude. We don't want to be a sectarian. So don't do anything that's going to cause any division. But it's interesting to me that he will say that there is a line, though. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you don't, uh, there's not much he has to say for you. You've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And that's the dividing line. If you don't, then you're lost. Uh, grace and works. The denominational world almost universally holds that salvation from sin and action of becoming a Christian is achieved solely on the basis of God's grace apart from man's obedience. They will call us the ones working our way to heaven. And there is no doubt that even some of the Lord's church view this relationship to God in some kind of a legal way, like, make, like going before a judge in a criminal courtroom. They're hoping that leniency will be given in sentencing, and instead of condemnation, they'll receive a slap on the wrist. And how many people view their day in light of a system of columns headed with good deed versus bad deed? And they're doing their best to put as many good deeds on that good deed side so that they, it evens out as they go through life. The Apostle Paul wrote about such a concept. The Roman brethren were dealing with the concept that the grace of God is given to the sinner. So in their mind they thought, well, you know, if sin brings about grace, then let's just go out there and sin all the more so the more grace I'll get. And Paul said, God forbid. That was never in the mind of God. The grace of God is not a license to sin. But... Mr. Hawley and others believe that it is. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are in sin, dead to sin live any longer therein? The Bible speaks of works that are accompanied by our faith. True biblical faith is, is trust co-joined with obedience. Obedience is to do what we are commanded. God commands that we have faith and that our works are those that are in harmony with his will. Now, Hawley believes that we are not under law, 
Therefore, we are carried through life with basic principles, and we are to be left, left alone to figure it out. He believes that works cannot save an individual in any sense. But James thought so in James chapter 2, verse 14 through 26. I did something in here that I hadn't done but uh, in any other thing, but, you know, he believes that we're not under law of any sort. But I broke down chapter Matthew 5, 6, and 7, those three chapters. And I broke them down into commands that Jesus gave those who wanted to be a part of the kingdom. We're to be mournful, meek, hunger for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, remain faithful even during persecution. We're to be the salt of the earth, the light on the hill. We're not to remain angry with our brother. We're not to commit adultery in our thoughts or in deeds. We're to be honest in our oaths. Don't be vengeful. Love your enemies. Be perfect as God is perfect. Don't be hypocrites or men pleasers. Pray to God, the Father. Forgive those who trespass against us. Fast uh, with the right attitude. Lay up treasures in heaven, not earth. Serve only God. Trust in God. Provide those things which we need. Don't make judgments based upon appearance only. Don't be a hypocrite. Seek God and be benevolent. Trust others. The way you, treat others the way you want to be treated. Go by way of the straight gate. Beware of false prophets. Obey the will of God. Be wise and not foolish. And that's just Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It's silly to me for anyone to believe that we're not under law today. Law. God is going to leave commands for us to do. But as was pointed out in the last hour, even though we do every one of them perfectly, we're still an unjust servant. But God expects us to do his will. I want to touch on this very quickly because this is something that just <laughs> confounded me. He makes this statement. This is the statement I was looking for before, but I didn't find it. All of us unwittingly hold private views that are not in total agreement with God's word. Think about that. That's a broad generalization made about all of us. All of us hold private views which are not in total agreement with God's word. He does not say that there is a possibility that the denial of Christ can strike at the very heart of the Christian faith. He does say that. But he thinks that only the denial of Jesus will place one outside the realm of the kingdom. Aaron's opinions on the doctrinal matter does not expel one from the kingdom. He goes on to say that one might believe differently about the second coming of Christ, correct worship, biblical organizations, proper use of church funds, etc., it is the case that a faithful Christian can hold the views that are error. Is it, no, that's a question. Woo. Let me make sure that's set in a question. Is it the case that a faithful Christian can hold the views that are error and not practice them, yet be found faithful by Christ at the judgment? In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, acceptable unto God. And he goes on to say, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What happens to us is as we become Christians, we begin to seek those things which are holy. God is holy, and only those who are holy can approach him, and if we are unholy, we cannot. Our prayers will not be heard. We cannot remain in fellowship with God, with Christ, or even our own brethren. And we, can, we will be unfit to inherit the prize of a crown. Holiness puts out sin, either in thought or in practice, so that we will be called the children of God. The thought that one can come to God with error in his thoughts and present his body as a sacrifice is living a life of unwise foolishness. There is no doubt any of us from time to time are working on issues in our hearts but the faithful work it out by comparing and aligning our thoughts and actions with the word of God, not what others are doing around us. The Bible is very clear that we will find our thoughts are open to God and we will also be judged by the thoughts and actions that we do here upon this earth. 
You know, it's easy for us to see that there is much error for, in this book and others. For someone to take in and those in ignorance of the Bible might be filled with the nonsense and be lost. Liberalism, like antiism, is an abuse of the word of God. We must be careful and make sure that we are willing to prove all things, hold to those things which are true. May we all work to know the book better than anyone else or anything else we might come to know in this life for the reward of the next one. Thank you, Brother Wayne. When I hear from someone like this or read a book or an article like this, the first thing that comes to my mind is that here is a person that does not know or is completely neglecting the way to ascertain the authority of God from the New Testament of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't make statements like that if you understood what the Bible really teaches. For example, when Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1.10, he begged, that's what beseech means, he, he begged those brethren by the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus. In other words, he's doing it by the authority of the Lord. That they all speak the same thing. That there be no divisions among you. That you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and same judgment. Yet you will read about Paul and Barnabas strongly disagreeing. Had a sharp uh, disagreement over whether to take John Mark on the second preaching to her or not. Now, I can just see one of these fellows here saying, well, Paul, what did you mean by 1 Corinthians 1.10? For it's obvious you violated it. But there's two th different things there. Uh, one has to do with what does God require of me, the imperatives, the obligatory matters, in order to be saved and remain faithful. The other has to do with the disagreement on how to carry it out, which was not obligatory. I found over the years a great many of my brethren can have a greater falling out over their opinions, one wanting to think it's better than somebody else's, than they do what the Bible actually lays out as obligatory in order to be saved or remain saved. But Paul and Barnabas didn't. Now, do you want to see an example of Paul applying 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and verse 10? Just travel over there to this record that he gave you about the situation in, in uh, Antioch of Syria, the church there, when Peter was there, and this is what he said. Verse 11, chapter 2. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Then he tells you why. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation, which means hypocrisy. But listen, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, and then he goes his reasoning and shows what he did. Now, Peter was in violation of obligatory matters, and Paul was stood into the faith. On the other hand, the different ways we might discharge obligatory matters, there shouldn't be any disagreement over that. That's one reason in the church that God put elders in the church, so that they would have the final say in what's the best way to discharge the obligation as far as what's been laid upon this church to do in order for it to be faithful. I tell you, this man, though he's dead now, had not one scintilla of understanding of what I just said. And most of them don't. They do not know how to ascertain Bible authority. And more than that, they do not respect the authority of God set out in the New Testament. Right. And so they take passages like I've just read and array them against one another. And yet they're perfect harmony. Folks, listen. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, whatever he's talking about, if you're going to go to heaven, everybody's going to have to believe the same thing about it. Now, if that's not what he's saying, what words would he have to choose in order to say it? That's what he's saying. He's plainly saying all those things that we must believe in order to be saved from our sins and those things as Christians that we must follow in order to be faithful, then you've got to believe the same thing. There can't be any divisions among you. 
You're to be of the same mind and the same judgment. But as to the kind of attire you wear in order to dress yourself up, I might disagree with that. And in the church, when the elders have made a decision as to what is the option that's most expedient to discharge the obligation, it's the obligation I'm concerned about. I may not think that the decision they've made is the best one, but God put them in that position, not me. And I'm sure if, if you let everybody rotate in and out, that you'd find out that others wouldn't agree with what those folks who didn't agree but now are in did in the first place. Somebody has to have the final say in everything or there can't be things done decently and in order. And just go over there and, and take the example he started with, those brethren in Ethiopia, if they were brethren. Take them and the idea of the Lord's Supper and then put it into Galatians 2 instead of Peter pulling back from those Gentile brethren that certainly came from Jerusalem that were Jewish brethren. And you'll see that that's an obligatory matter is to the observance of the Lord's Supper. Not only what it is and the emblem, but when it's done, how long does it take to understand that? But that's the ignorance that's upon us today, and it's rather large ignorance. So we just must go ahead and keep on going on, regardless of what these people say. Remember this, it doesn't make any difference how many of these books are written, or how many of these preachers preach what they preach. The Bible doesn't change. And there was a time when people were open to receive the Bible as the Word of God, and thus we were far more united. But when the people begin to change, they don't have respect for it. They won't learn how to ascertain it. They have a greater desire to meld into the larger, pious folks that they want to consider brethren. Then you're going to find ways to justify it, and they're going to have to twist the scriptures to do it. But the Bible hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. It won't change tomorrow. It's the same book that was here 100 years ago. It's the same one people used to bring the church to it. So what should I do? If I'm the only one, what should I do? If you're the only one where you are, what should you do? In other words, you're the only one who still stands for the truth and respects it and knows how to ascertain it and will abide by it no matter what. What should you do? Just keep on doing it. Yeah, but I don't agree with it. So what? What is it to me that you don't agree with it? If I know it, it's to God I'm accountable, I'll just keep on doing it. Yeah, but I don't like it. Well, just don't like it. I'll keep doing it. Well, I don't want you to preach it. Well, you don't want to always. I'll keep preaching it. Well, I'll kill you if you do. Kill away. I'll go to heaven and leave you here. Yeah. <laughs> Why can't we form that view? It's the view in the minds of the saints we read of in the New Testament concerning God, the Christ, the gospel, and the church. So when I read things like this, especially a man who, had, who really put out such a great, uh, at least I think it was, uh, set of uh, correspondence courses uh, some time ago, like a long time ago, and then come up with this stuff and virtually make null and void everything he ever did before that. Anyway, that's where we are. Thank you, Brother Wayne. We're going to stand in this business just a moment.